really the state of wellness that we want to achieve by focusing on what's going on with our, within our total selves. Our mind and body being connected, it means understanding what you're feeling, understanding the way that you interact with the environment and things going on in the world are affecting you, how you interpret that emotionally and cognitively, as well as what you're experiencing in terms of sensations. Uh, and all of that then leads to what you do. So mental health is when you are aware of and taking care of your entire being. Yes. Yeah, that's a terrific definition. I like its holistic nature. Um, the WHO, uh, for those of you who are, who are look, interested in you know, learning more or looking at uh, mental health, the WHO defines it exactly that way, which is a state of well-being, right? So that mental health is not just the absence of the absence of mental illness, but in fact is a state in which we're um, productive, well-being, you know, in a state of well-being, thriving. Um, we often hear um, the, the, the term resilience, Anne-Marie, and in a time like this where, um, you know, a lot's happening and there's a lot of uncertainty and we don't exactly know what's going to happen, and certainly the things that were expected, the things that graduate, graduating or recently graduated students were expecting to have happen, um, has been altered and, and, and uncertainty has been introduced. How should we think about resilience? What is resilience? And then maybe we can talk about how do we, how do we, you know, bolster it? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And that's what everyone see, is struggling with. And again, many people are kind of tired of hearing this. I have to be resilient, which to, you know, just the general way of thinking is that means I've got to snap back to normal and whatever normal was, right? But this is something that we, we really have to take hold of and understand too. When we talk about resilience in the field of mental health, we're not talking about not changing. In fact, what resilience is, especially at a time of great uncertainty like this, we don't know how long this is gonna go on. And we don't know how long it'll take to find uh, a vaccine and develop a vaccine. We don't know how long it would take then to disseminate it widely um, or for developing better therapeutics for people who become ill with COVID. At the same time with all that's going on in terms of awareness and the activism that's happening and there's great unrest in many ways, we don't know how long that's gonna last. So there's a lot that's uncertain and it's affected as we know that, you know, all through our lives, the financial parts of our lives, our relationships, everything. Resilience is where we recognize what is happening and we are using our coping resources to manage ourselves to develop and grow even if we experience great trauma. We're not rubber bands who are getting stretched and boom, we're gonna like, you know, snap back to the original form. But resilience is taking what you experience, managing it, learning from it, accepting the toughest parts of it, and then finding the resources to move forward as we adapt to ever this ever-changing world. Does that make sense? Yes, it, it, it does make sense. And I, 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 as we go on, would like to even unpack it some more in terms of you know, practical things that, that we can all do to, um, to cope or to, you know, to, to, to build on and, and sort of muster those coping skills. I also wanted to comment on, on your comments about how much is happening, right? And, and, and to, to discuss this idea that, so feelings of uncertainty, fear, um, anxiety, sadness for, for what's been lost, um, including grief and potentially losing, losing loved ones or being worried about yourself if you're, if you're ill or, or someone who's, who's sick. We've, we've heard this described in the media and in various places as a possible um, mental health crisis associated with you know, physical distancing, coronavirus, et cetera. And, and at Jed, you know, I, I wanna say on behalf of myself and, and, and our colleagues, and, and then get your reaction to this, Anne-Marie, that these are perfectly normal reactions to this kind of a situation. I want to make sure that we don't pathologize them or that we feel somehow guilty or bad about having these kinds of feelings. These feelings are natural reactions to difficult circumstances. Now that doesn't mean they're not serious and we don't, and, and it doesn't mean we don't need to get care and tell others that we're 
we're struggling, but I also don't want to, um, you know, paint them through a, a, a pathological lens that that these reactions are 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 an illness. Uh, but I'd like your your reaction to that. You, you know, you're right on. And as Ken said in the beginning, I um, I run the Center for Anxiety and Related Disorders disorders. But in order to understand disorders, I also spent 30 years studying what is a normal emotions. And anxiety is one of our basic human emotions. I think everybody we're talking to here knows this. If you're not feeling some anxiety at this time and have been for since COVID started, well, you got to check yourself. Why not? Um, because anxiety happens when there's something right that is, is going to harm us or potentially harm us or it's going to cause great difficulties for us so in the immediate sense we have fear which is an expression of panic if something is immediately going to harm us you're sitting on an airplane flying somewhere and the guy next to you isn't wearing a mask and he's coughing at you <gasps> there's great reason to have panic sensations racing heart breathlessness such and even to get angry which would be another normal emotion in that uh, period. You graduated from Columbia and you're waiting to hear about the job you're supposed to have and you thought you were going to have, but that company is furloughing. You're worried. That's normal and you should be. And, and anxiety, when it works for us as a normal emotion, helps us then to problem solve, to get activated, to motivate us to take care and do things. So it is perfectly normal and okay to experience anxiety, sadness for different losses, including the loss of your freedoms right now and your just ability to go out and do things, you know, all kinds of stuff that we can talk more about. Um, there's also anger and upset at what is happening in many different ways in the world and the injustices that we're, you're, we're seeing. Using this using these emotions, owning them, recognizing them, and putting them to work for you to be active and take care of things and get involved, that's helpful. But there's a flip side, which is why I have the clinic for anxiety and related disorders. Because if we step back and we just dig into the emotion and focus on it and how terrible we are and terrible things are and, and how alone we are and no one understands and no one can connect and those and you know and just do an us them then it just sort of stews in you and that's where we could get into trouble yeah yeah no thank you for that and one of the things that many young adults have, have said to us that we work with at the jet foundation is that in the midst of all of these feelings that they're having some, you know, even many are also actually then feeling guilt for having these feelings because they also recognize that they have it, um, you know, they're, they're relatively uh, privileged relative to many other people who are dealing with more difficult circumstances. So then there's another layer of emotion, which is, which is guilt that I shouldn't actually be, be having these feelings. Right, that, and, and we are seeing that. And I, I have to say, it's not just in the, in the privileged. There's, all, there's just a whole range of that that's going on. And again, it's taking stock. What does that guilt say to you? What in your, when you're saying this is terrible, I, you know, I have so much, I'm so lucky, this, you know, I, my life has no meaning because of it, or whatever you're saying to yourself, question a little further, dig deep and ask, what can you do with that then that would again be productive and helpful? Not that you just want to make yourself feel better, that's not the point, but to turn that into an activity or into some action steps. And look, the smallest steps, letter writing or email writing these days, reaching out to someone, um, donating if you can, whatever it may be, the smallest steps are helpful and you've got to allow yourself to do that and not put yourself down if you can't recognizing these things and validating your feelings is important and connecting then with people you can talk to about these feelings and about what you see happening so that you can make some connections and get support is important. Yes. When you talk about these steps that can be taken to try to, to, try to process and to, and to deal with all of, all of these things, I'm struck by the things you mentioned. Writing an email, reaching out to someone else, donating or you know your time you, you know or, or, or being you know an, an activist in some way these are all um human connection 
type activities. Can you say more about that? Like what is it that those kinds of things are doing to help us in our emotional health? Well, see, this is, this is the thing. We, we all, we all really are meant and, and developed as human beings that connect with one another. And even though our personalities are distributed from the more introverted to the way less, intro, you know, the more extroverted, still it involves connection in some kind to the world. And so it's important because we get feedback on how things are going and how we are at the same time that we're able to engage and we're able to make differences in ways and, and get engaged with the world and have opportunity and provide opportunity. So it, we are a social being. So connection is fundamental to the experience of emotions. And you don't have to be the outgoing head of a project or whatever. You don't have to be that person. But you can not You can be the quiet person who's aware, taking note, and then sends in some thoughts for consideration. There's so many different ways. Everyone needs connection. And it's also so helpful because at times of great uncertainty like this, having some connection does help, again, to ground you to know that you're a part of the world, you're not forgotten. And I ask you all to think about your friends and those you might have known at Columbia, those who maybe are in families that you know or in your neighborhoods and such, who's alone? Reach out to those folks because it validates you're part of the world and you are important. We want you here, right? So that's where the, it, we feed off of one another in, and we could do it in healthy ways. Yes. You know, this, this idea of connecting or, or, and thinking about who, who else might be alone. For those of you who are on the phone who are fortunate enough to have um, living grandparents or living great aunts and uncles or, you know, people that are, are older and, and, and physical distancing and may even physical distance longer because they're in a more vulnerable class, that is a, just a fantastic relationship to build that can, can benefit both ways to stay very connected to um, to those older, those older people in your lives. Um, I also want to say a few words. So, so this, so, so this, idea, we, this idea of connection, connecting to others, even while distant, you know, even in this, in this period of uncertainty. Um, if we cut this, I'll make a few comments and, and Amory, you know, weigh in as well. But also now how you think about your routines, even in this period of disruption, right? So trying to stay on a regular pattern with your sleep, um, with, uh, you know, how you're, how you're active, uh, physically active, whether it's exercise or going for walks, you know, if, if you're able to do that is very, very important. How you eat. I know these things sound like sort of standard cliches, but they really are important for your mental health. And as Anne-Marie um, defined mental health, it, you know, defined it in the context of mental and physical health. Um, you know, being careful about alcohol or, or drugs or, you know, these kinds of things as well. Just, you know, taking, um, so taking the time to take care of yourself um, will, will have very positive uh, protective benefits for your mental health. Well, if I can say, when you think about mental wellness, if you really um, think about this, what you want to do is do a self-check. Just take stock for a second, sit quietly, try to breathe slowly, and go through a review. What are you thinking? What are your primary thoughts that you've been having over the last week, two weeks? What have been your feelings that you've been experiencing? Where do you see physical tension or difference in your body? So are you getting aches and pains, headaches, stomach aches? Are you having trouble with eating? You're eating more, you're eating less. How is your sleep, as John is saying? All of that helps you to check in and to think through whether you've been more affected in some ways. So then you can do things. As you say, you could do yoga and mindfulness meditation. You could do deep breathing just to get some sense of centering. John, when you talk about routines, our routines have gone off, you know, the charts out of whack, like no tomorrow. And, and yet it's so important to think about what were your routines and what you were typical in terms of your lifestyle and doing things. And now because we can't be moving around as much, how can you set a routine for yourself that can help soothe you and center you on a day-to-day -day basis? 
And that's where you want to build in some of like breathing or relaxation, soothing yourselves. Don't feel guilty to, you know, take a hot bath or, you know, do your nails or whatever you might want. Do not feel guilty about things. You have to take care of yourself and do things that are pleasant for yourself. And then I think one of the things really that's key here too is we've been so stuck and you know the way we've been able to move through the world is like just so shrunk. I live in Brooklyn, I work at Columbia. I've been here now since March 12th in my house. I'm not moving out of this house, it's driving me nuts. But my overall movement, I had to go and I did. I use a trampoline now because that gets me moving and it's what I can do in this, in you know, the little space I have. You've got to look at your movement and how it's been restricted because you're meant to move and try to do things where you can safely, obviously. So there's a lot. And then the social connections also are part of taking stock and see what do you need and how to reach out so you get non-work related or seeking job related, but just social connections, whether it's online happy hours, playing games on Zoom, there's all kinds of stuff to do. Do it. Date. Date online. Hey, this is actually a cool time to date. You, you really can't see one another. There's no pressure to hook up, but you can get to know the person and talk with them. So that's, that's what all part of taking care of your wellness. Yes. Yeah. And you know, the, um, the comments about doing something, right? Well, it's an interesting sort of time and opportunity because of the activism that's happening and really driven by, by youth around racial justice and addressing police brutality. Um, I have a couple of questions for you about this, but, but the one, one comment I want to make is that, you know, participating and being part of a movement is, is also protective for our mental health. We're connecting with others. We're, we're attaching to a larger cause in a, in a sense of solidarity, you know, aiming to make change. So, um, so in getting involved safely in terms of, you know, physical distancing and what, and what you will and won't do um, can be very protective for mental health. That w one thing is to, is, is to comment on that, Anne-Marie, but I also wanted to ask with regard to, you know, what we've seen recently, um, the murder of George Floyd, um, the, the protests and the rallies, which are, which are beautiful in terms of just the outpouring of people. And yet, um, you know, we see... Uh, the violence of people driving cars into crowds. I mean, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot um, that is um, infuriating and, and, and frustrating and, and um, depressing also while this big social movement is happening. And would you offer any different or additive advice in terms of how to take care of your own mental health um, in this context uh, on top of what we've already discussed? Yeah, what, you know, another thing to think about in taking care of your own mental health, and especially in this, uh, you know, in this time, is thinking through what you can and cannot control. Because this is critical. We can get, again, so into difficult emotional states that, you know, do us less well and, you know, and take us off track if we're focusing on how out of control everything is and how horrible these other people are, and they, they are, and such, what can you do? When you focus on, okay, these, you know, there are people who are gonna do terrible things, driving cars into crowds, you know, brutality, racism, that's them. You can't control them, and we, you might not be able to change them. What you can control is your reaction, and again, how and what you do with it. So this is where you can work for um, on a, in different um, for different candidates through online work that people are doing, so that you're taking action. You can get out, as you say, and march, and you could do things. And there are so many peaceful marches that are going on here in Brooklyn. We have marches all the time. It's beautiful. Um, so there's so many ways to do that. That's what you can control. You can wear a mask when you go to these things so that you know that you are going to be safe. There's so many ways that you have control that edify you. And knowing that you can't control those other people, then you also can protect yourself better from them. And uh, direct your attention to folks and to places where there's more conversation and discussion and debate. And it may be spirited, but it's in, it's meant to help people think and make change. That's, that's what I would say, what you can control, 
you know, what you can't control, you let go of. Yes. Um, what about, how do we know, what advice do you have about when, when should we recognize that we need professional help? You know, that, that um, it, it's, time to, it's time to reach out to, to, uh, to get professional mental health uh, care. Yeah. So one of the first things I ask people to think about is, are you finding that other folks are asking you, what's wrong with you? <laughs> are they commenting like, why are you so irritable? Or I haven't seen you, what's going on? So first of all, take stock in what are other people saying? Um, and this, the other thing then again is do that check. Uh, what have you been thinking and have you been spinning, 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 spinning? with ideas that are giving you headaches at the same time, they're making you so tied up, all right? Because those are signs. If you have then, again, the sensations that are going through your body of being stressed, of tension and such, if you're not sleeping, if all these things are off whack, your sleep, your appetite, your social relationships, it's like, wait, whoa, whoa. You don't have to wait till things get really far off. Definitely don't do that. I mean, just take stock and say, you know, what's going on here? Who can I talk to? And it's perfectly okay to start talking to friends and family and, you know, say, you know, I've been upset. How about you? Now, with that said, we don't always have the most supportive friends and family to talk to. So we recognize that. And that's why then there's so many different outlets. And especially now we have telehealth, uh, the, you know, sort of silver lining, if there is one with COVID is it's allowed us to provide services mental health services, counseling, therapy, whatever you want to call it, by way of Zoom type stuff. So reach out. That is the thing, is reach out and don't wait. I mean, we wouldn't want you to wait if there was a medical issue. This is a medical issue in a way, again, because it's all set up together. Mind, body is connected. So do reach out. Yeah, maybe it's a little bit more because we have a question that's come in about any advice, let's say you recognize that you probably would benefit this from this, but nonetheless, you have anxiety about reaching out for help and asking for help. How, what advice do you have about sort of getting, you know, getting through that? Yeah, my question is, I have anxiety. I, I'm afraid to, to reach out. I want you to think through why. Tell me about that. What does that mean? If you reach out, what? Does that mean there's something really wrong with you? Does that mean you're weak? What is it that you are responding to that is holding you back? And think about the longer you hold back, what are you losing or what are you gaining by holding back? If you're staying stuck or it's getting worse, you have to you know, come to terms with the risk of reaching out means a may get help. And yeah, if my parents or my friends or someone knows for I don't know what reason, but maybe they do, are they gonna look down on me? Well. They've got the problem there because you are taking action and taking control and you're doing something for yourself that's really benefit that could be beneficial for you. Um, if you're sheltered alone, you definitely can do this and should could and should do this. There are meetups that you could go online for that have all kinds of you you all know this, you guys. They have all kinds of interest groups and you know, various topics and stuff that you can, you know, work with, whether you want to be in like, you know, a uh, literature group online, or if it's something about the environment, what have you, do that kind of thing, create human connections through meetups and such, that's going to help with your mental health. And there's also, quite frankly, we run a lot of therapy groups online. And yeah, I said the word therapy, they're therapy groups to help with managing COVID anxiety and stress, to help with all kinds of emotions and things that are going on, it's okay. Get into them and not only will you help yourself, but you can help someone else who's in the group. Yes, I think also one of the other um, silver linings with regard to COVID is, um, you know, this concept of stigma, right? Around mental yeah. health. And it's a word that can mean a lot of things. It typically means or it's typically referred to to mean sort of the shame and, and the secrecy um, around mental health issues, not wanting to ask for help, feeling embarrassed about it or, or fearful. Um, over time, this has started to wane, although it's still a significant problem. Um, but because of COVID and a recognition that we're all feeling anxiety and grief and depression, you know, to different extents, 
um, I think this is an opportunity where we can sort of really break through stigma collectively, you know, as a, as a community, because um, th this experience has normalized these, these, these sort of feelings and they are normal in, in, in human normal. So um, I don't know if that's, that's a helpful well, concept also, but now's the time I think for all of us to just break it right through it. Absolutely. And you know, that's the other thing. There are some really great groups that are online. Uh, look at the Good Men Project online. The Good Men Project uh, was developed by uh, all these like forward thinking guys in all sectors from sports and journalism, politics, you name it. And it's really to reach out, especially to men who the stigma for men in seeking help and with you know identifying and owning their mental health issues has been huge. It's sunk political careers in the past, well, you know this and such. The Good Men Project is amazing. And there's so many different forums that they have for men and women to join in and get involved in and also learn about how to care for yourself when you are struggling with depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder, what, what have it. It's a, it's a way of breaking down stigma. And then certainly there's a lot of uh, young adult and emerging adult groups, again, online. Uh, anxiety in teens for younger people, you could direct friends and family members to. There's so much online around breaking down stigma. And I actually think this generation is gonna be the one that does it because yes. that you you are these they've been so forward thinking with the programs on campuses you know and such that they've had across the country um so i have great hope for the future of stigma really being something that's going to be put away down the line yes um i also want to mention that at the jed foundation we have a project called love is louder and at loveislouder.com, there are a lot of ideas for exactly the question that's being asked about how do you create human connection. Um, we have a whole, a whole part of that site, uh, which is about staying connected and different ideas for how to do that. So I encourage you to, I encourage you to look at that. Um, I want to ask uh, and, and open a discussion about what to do if you're worried about somebody that is in your house or somebody that you're close to, maybe even a parent, you know, um, in, in, who may be struggling around their mental health. How do you handle that? How do you have those kinds of, you know, open those kinds of conversations? Yeah, the first thing we have to do is listen. And I, and you know, and I, I hope that family members and friends can do that for people themselves, you know, for you, for each of us, is just listen. Uh, one of the things that happens when you see someone struggling uh, is that you want to fix it for them. And it's difficult to fix what is internal. And so mental health issues really arise from, again, the way you're thinking and the way you're experiencing your emotions and what's going on, how you're interpreting or misinterpreting things, and then also the way that it's running stress through your body. So it really has to be the person speaking and, and just being available, just sitting with them and say, hey, I'm wondering how you're doing as just a start and seeing how and what they start talking about. And one of the questions that I learned a long time ago when they say, well, you know, it's just everything's up in the, I can't stand the way things are. Just the simple question, how's that? How's that is an open-ended question, or you could say, tell me more. That's open-ended, it's not judging. We want to stay away from questions or things that make someone feel that you're judging them. Um, it's not giving them the words to speak because let them use their own words and try to find their own words. So you start by listening. And then you say, what I hear you saying is it's really taken a toll on you. You've been out of work or you've been here, you, you know, you got the kids at home or everything that's going on. It's taken a toll on you. How can I help? You, is, do you want to try to find someone to talk with? I can be there with you. Because this is the big, a big thing, is we can't do the change for another person. Remember, we can't change someone else. But what we can do is accompany them and let them know they're not alone and they're not rejected because they're having difficulties. You're with them and you're there to accompany them to where they need to go that may be helpful to them. So I invite parents, I invite young adults or whoever to be in the first sessions together if that's what they want, if that's helpful, you know, to the person as we get to know them and then get to try to help them. 
That's great. Yeah, and I, and I just want to add, um, to make sure I say this before the, the session is over, um, to make sure that you all are aware that there are free 24-7 crisis services. If, if you find yourself in a situation or you're worried about somebody else that you think is um, you know, potentially dangerous or you, know, you, you really need advice, one is a crisis uh, text service. It's called Crisis Text Line. And you text 741741, and you'll be connected to a counselor who can text back and forth. The other is a phone line, which is 1-800-273-TALK, um, and, and, you can, and you can speak to someone. So um, both are available uh, all the time and, and, and free. Um, if I could just add, John, if you're out of the States, if you're you know, over in Europe, Asia, wherever you are, you, you could send an email um, to, I would think, the Alumni Association and get it, and they'll get it to us. We often have connections in other countries um, for helping to locate people who are mental health professionals. Um, so we can try to do that or connect you to one of the international services, or even there's great online services for some self-help and self-care. Yes. And we have a question has come in. Um, uh, one of the listeners um, experiences their anxiety as uh, pressure in the chest um, and, and sort of superficial uh, breathing you know, uh, what they describe as from the chest and not, not from the tummy or stomach. Um, and they're wondering, um, you know, if you have any advice about how they can manage that as they're experiencing, are there any breathing exercises or anything that can help, you know, uh, help them with this? Yeah, and that's actually one of the most like cardinal sensations and reactions when we have anxiety that keeps running. Um, it is, chest breathing and and you know not to get into the whole thing but we need to breathe when we breathe deeply into the diaphragm um we get sufficient and enough oxygen coming in and carbon dioxide expelling when we breathe into the chest it's not we're not doing anything dangerous it's just we're making our chest muscles work and it's you know and it's we have to keep breathing more quickly or harder in order to you know, get in and out, inhale, exhale. So deep diaphragmatic breathing, I'm gonna change this for a second just so you can see. If, let me just show you, if you put your hand on your belly where your pinky is just above your um, belly button and you imagine a tube running down your throat at, and it ends in a balloon under your hand in your stomach. If you just quietly to yourself think, inhale as you Inhale deeply to raise your hand and you know fill in fill in the balloon and then slowly exhale. That's deep diaphragmatic breathing. And you do that like to the count of 10. Inhale one, relax. Inhale two, relax. That's the start of deep diaphragmatic breathing. There are many, many sites. If you put deep diaphragmatic breathing, YouTube, or you know, you'll find plenty of videos online um, that can help. I will also say our friends to the north, Anxiety Canada. Anxiety Canada has a phenomenal app called MindShift. It's free and it has all of these tools for diaphragmatic breathing for checking the way you're thinking, all anxiety Canada's mind shift. I love that group. Um, go to are their- you saying, Are you saying mind share or mind shift? Mind shift, shift, mind shift. But go to that Anxiety Canada site and there's great tools and information and the diaphragmatic breathing tool is there in mind shift. Excellent. I think it's mind shift. Anyway, it's Anxiety Canada. <laughs> um, well, thank you. Yeah, actually, Jenna just put put it into the into the chat. Um, I want to I want to pivot a little bit about it, to talk directly to the to the experience that you're having as as graduating seniors and and sort of what it might mean for you to be in this um, unexpected situation, right, where there was an order to what was supposed to happen. You know, year end celebrations with friends, a graduation. Uh, job interviews, you know, getting getting that first post college job and sort of launching into that, and and of course now there's there's disruption, um, and the question being is it is it is it all bad, you know, um, are are there some good or or reasons for hope and optimism in this? 
And you know, I, I'd like to start by saying, well, one of the domains of um, protective factors for our mental health is what we call uh, life skills, right? Being, being able to deal with adversity and to cope with it, to um, be, being able to handle change um, and the unexpected, um, to problem solve, you know, the, the, these kinds of areas help us because life is going to throw curveballs at us and we have to, we have to be able to, to deal with them. So I want you to just, you know, take a, take a moment and recognize that you're learning an extraordinary amount, we all are, in what we're going through now that you may not fully appreciate, that is going to serve you, um, you know, in the, in the future. And so you almost could take a student's mindset to what's happening, you know, pay attention to leadership and decisions that are being made, how they're being made, how different states are doing different things, different countries are doing different things, what's working, what's not working, what's your view of that, what's your perspective of that? Um, because there's, there's just a great opportunity here to, to, to learn. Um, and also, uh, in this context of solidarity, well, community, right? Connections with other people. You're now part of a generation and a class that everybody knows what it means to be part of the class of 2020. Everybody knows in the whole world. Um, I would like to submit or offer that I think that's gonna wind up being quite a positive, that everybody who's in the class of 2020, whether you're you know, networking, interviewing, meeting you know, at a social event or in the context of a professional event, you have a connection and shared experience. Um, and, and I think that ultimately that's gonna wind up being quite powerful and that you can think about how you build and how you network. You know, um, the generation that grew up during World War II went on to become the greatest generation and have books written about them and, and is lauded as the most productive generation, you know, I guess in the history of our country. You know, uh, it's been a while since I, I read that book by uh, Tom Brokaw. But, but I think those possibilities really exist for you and for, and for your generation. And I, I really believe it. I'm not trying to say it just to, you know, Put, put, a, put a positive spin on this, but um, I, I think you should think about that and how, and how maybe you can help create that for yourself and for your, for your entire class. And Amory, I don't know if you wanna comment on that. Yeah, no, I, I mean, when you think about this class, you all were born right around, you know, and into the, the, the Twin Towers falling and, you know, 9-11. And your co college career was bookmarked with uh, the pandemic and such. And it's like, as you're saying, John, you think about the greatest generation. Well, boy, this generation so far has had, you know, right now, two of the most major events that we can think of since then, really. I mean, Vietnam War was another thing, but, um, and this is time to think about the fact that, you know, in young adulthood, which is we say from 18 to around 30 years of age, we know that this is a time of discovery for you, of um, checking out various things from, you know, partners and who you want to be with to what you want to do with your life and careers. You all, given that you're coming from Columbia, you have been successful. You know how to work hard. You've been on the, uh, the treadmill that has gotten you to Columbia. Maybe this is a way not to pause, but to really reflect. And it's going to give you some time to reflect. And again, while it's going to be difficult because we can't control what all the future em your employers and stuff and how they're going to manage things and what's going to happen, we can't control that. But you can control as you're reflecting on who you are and what you want to do and what you're seeing happening in the world and taking stock the way John just said, you can and you, you can make differences for yourself by, you know, testing things out and exploring a little further before committing yourself to something that might be, you know, just down another treadmill of run, 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 because you're constantly having to, you know, keep going. So think about that. It's an opportunity, I think, if you look at it this way. Yeah. Yeah, and since we're here, you know, uh, as part of the CAA, also um, it may be a good time to connect with alumni, alumni in different fields or um, careers that interest you, just for an informational interview, a discussion. So, you know, that could be part of a period of learning and, and building the network. I would say that this is a time where many people are busy, so do not be discouraged if you get turned down. 
Um, but there are a lot of people who, who, who would be willing to do it. I mean, I, I say yes is just one example to anybody that wants to learn about healthcare or public health or, or, or nonprofit, and, and certainly especially um, alum or, or alumni or students who, who have the shared experience of going to, to Columbia. Um, a question was asked about how can alumni or can alumni access mental health services at the school? I, I don't actually know the answer to that. Um, and I don't know if you do, Anne-Marie, but that is obviously an answerable question. So I'm going to assume that we can get that answer and there's a mechanism to send it out to the people who are on the, on the line. Um, in terms of cue card, Anne-Marie, if anyone's interested in accessing services there, how, how do they go about that? Yeah, they can uh, call the main number um, and uh, the main number for cue card is 212 342 3800, right? Uh, I just put it in there. That's Q card. Um, and what'll happen is, you know, with Q card, they take a limited number of insurances, but they also, we have trainees, so there's sliding scale and there's self pay, or we will help find someone who takes your insurance again through the Columbia network and such. So, yeah. Great, great. Um, I myself am out of questions or topics. Um, I don't know if anyone has any questions. If you want to ask questions, now is the time to ask before we make some any summary statements and, and close. Um, and I so, think you know the other thing I'll just extend is being someone who went through grad school, psychology, and healthcare, mental health, working in the med school. Um, if people have questions, want to reach out through the Alumni Association to us, I'm happy to talk to you or have one of you know my colleagues talk to you about careers in our sector um, because I think, I think they're worthwhile careers and we'll need plenty more people in service in this way as time goes on. Yes, and I'll add the offer. At JED, I didn't talk too much about the JED Foundation, but we work with institutions with schools as think of us as a system change organization looking at all of the policies and programs and systems that a school puts in place around supporting mental health and reducing risks for substance use and suicide or a charity organization but if anyone's interested in learning more about that the same offer is Anne-Marie be happy to talk to you great welcome back Ken you're muted <laughs> I was too disciplined for my own good. Uh, I want to thank both of you, uh, Anne-Marie and John. This has been, I think, incredibly helpful. And it is uh, at a moment in time when we need community uh, more than ever. And um, that the Columbia alumni community is here to support. Um, uh, Jenna did drop in the link to the uh, alumni community, which is our online service, but feel free to uh, avail yourself to more of this programming over the summer. Next week, we have three additional programs. Uh, two are about community building uh, through our shared interest groups and arts access. And then we will also on Friday of next week have a um, session on the Columbia LinkedIn platform and community. So this will continue throughout the summer. We are in fact uh, archiving this, so you can revisit, you can send it to friends and family, uh, and by all means, feel free to reach out to us at the Alumni Association, and uh, we wish all of you uh, good health and safety, and look forward to uh, being with you again uh, on future calls, and eventually in person. So thank you both, and thank you, uh, Class of 2020, for joining us today.